And tonight, we're back in the book of Acts, in the chapter 1, Acts 21. Acts 21. Anybody in the Bible, put your hand up and pull it up in the Bible then, look. Acts chapter 21. You know, we've been through the book of Acts now since March, probably about 10 months. And we know the sisters have been listening because they have been in the quiz a couple of days ago. So the sisters have been there to take it in and listening. It's still one that's in anything, eh? Now we're in Acts 21 tonight. Has everybody got a Bible? And if we read Acts 21, right, Paul was returning to Jerusalem. This is his third and final missionary journey, and he's heading back to Jerusalem. And on his way back from Acts 18, he visits all the villages and towns and cities. And you know, in every village and town and city, he finds believers. The people who've been saved. All the way back to Jerusalem. From Acts 18. It's a third missionary journey. The we go through the backs for 10 months, right, since March. It may, might seem like a long time, right? But you know that 10 months up to Acts 21, we've covered 25 here in the book of Acts. Because Acts 1 up to 21 is roughly about 25 years. And you know, God has done so much in that 25 years. As we went through the book of Acts, and we've seen from 1 all the way through to this 21. Thank you much God has done. Souls have been saved, men have been put in positions, churches have been opened, people have been healed, delivered. There's been so much done. And you know something, we don't get a fraction of what's been done, because only one man's account, the man of Luke. Luke has an account, but so much has been done in the background that we haven't been seen, which is scraping the surface that's been done at that time in the book of Acts. Acts 1, right? Remember back in the beginning, Acts 1. How many believers were together? Can you remember? How many believers at the time? How many people saved at that time? Can anybody remember? In Acts 1. Billy. How many? I said, anybody else? Now I guess close. <laughs> it says there were 120 believers. Right? Then the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, Peter preached the gospel. How many were saved? 3,000. So for 120, the 3,000 were saved, right? Now, in the very next chapter, there's another 2,000 saved. So that's 5,000 people who've been saved just a couple of chapters. Acts 8, the enemy comes in, tries to stop the work of God, tries to stop the gospel being spread. But all the enemy does is spread the gospel. Because when the disciples are scattered, they go, remember back in Acts 1, Jesus said, you were preaching in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So now the gospel's been spread to Samaria, Judea, and it's went to Antioch. Now it's been spread out to Asia and out to Europe. Acts 9, Saul got saved, the one who was best fit the church, who became Apostle Paul. Acts 10, the first Gentile to be saved was Cornelius. Acts 11, the first Gentile top church in Antioch. Acts 13, was the start of Paul's missionary journey. Acts 15 is his second missionary journey, and now in Acts 21 is his last missionary journey, where he's heading to Rome, and as I said, he's visiting all the little villages, towns, and cities all the way back to Rome. I think it's 12 in total of visits, and every place he visits, he finds believers. There's believers, people's been saved, people's been baptized, and there are also those churches, there's buildings where people go to worship the praise of Lord Jesus Christ. God has done so much in the 25 years. So let's start with Acts 1, is 21 and Acts chapter 1 and 6. 21 and 6, sorry. Is that there? Yeah. Now it came to pass when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to course by the following day to Rhodes and from there to Patra and finding a ship sailing over to 
for Niagara, he went aboard, aboard and set sail. We had sighted at Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was unloaded, her cargo, and finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When he had come to the end of those days, we departed, went out on the way, and they all accompanied us with their wives and children till we, till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore <coughs> and prayed. We knelt down on the shore and prayed. See, Paul landed at his place, Tyre, and he finds disciples, again, believers, as he said, in the city. And the first thing they told Paul was not to go to Jerusalem by the Spirit. Because you know, in Jerusalem, persecution went to Paul. But nevertheless, Paul was determined to go to Jerusalem. But Paul stayed seven days, it says, with these disciples. And you know, that seven days, he would have encouraged them, he would have broke bread, he would have had fellowship, Paul would have preached them, probably preached the gospel. We don't know, maybe more, more souls would even saved. But you know, after the seven days is up, it says Paul left to head to Jerusalem. But if you think about it, right, as I said, the marks, 1 to 21 was roughly about 25 years. And God done so much, right? And sometimes for me and you, right, we say it, we are still loving the book of Acts. Because we're still preaching the gospel, souls are being saved, faithful are being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we're opening churches. And it's good to be reminded, right, I believe what God has done. Not just in our lives, but what He's done in Scotland in the last 25, 30 years. I was thinking all that after the foul the other day on the phone. And you know, the first time there was a mis- uh, convention in Scotland it was in Hart Hill. And it was roughly at the same timeline as the book of Acts, it was 33 years ago. The book of Acts is probably the last, from Acts 1 to 28, it was roughly about 30 to 33 years. So 33 years ago, men from England, led by the Holy Spirit, came to Hart Hill and put a tent up. And they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, in that mission, people got saved. You know, and after the men left, you know, there were no churches in Scotland at the time. There were no life churches, so they had no place to go. But you know something, the people were saved, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. When the men went back to England, I want to tell you something, God didn't go back to England. The Holy Spirit didn't go back to England. But the Holy Spirit was in the believers, they were still in Scotland. And they were led by the Holy Spirit. Because what they'd done, just like the book of Acts in the beginning, right? And the book of Acts, the people met together. They had house meetings and they drove together. And the old pastor told me, right? There was no churches, so what they'd done, they had house meetings. They met together, they broke bread together. They went to the gospel halls. There was Albert, Alistair, Morick, old John White and June, Alec and Jesse, Alan and Tom. They all got together in the houses and they prayed. And they continued to preach the gospel. They continued to lift up people in prayer. They got the gospel meetings, they broke bread, just like the people done in the book of Acts. Then old Alistair was the first man to be, become a minister of Scotland 30 years ago. God put a man in place that was old Alistair and he started to preach the gospel. Still wasn't any churches and he told me they rented the building and they called the church. So they had a rented the building now, they were preaching the gospel, souls were being saved. You know, 25 years ago, they bought the first church for Scholar Books. Then Montrose. I think there it was Cowan Beath. You know, today in Scotland, we've got six churches. We've got four outreaches. You know, in every place in Scotland you go to, just like Paul, when he came from the, when he went going back to Jerusalem, visiting all the towns and all the villages and all the cities. In every village and every town and city, they were so saved. So everywhere you go to Scotland today, you will find believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Ayrshire, they're Christians. Go to Aberdeen, you'll find Christians. Go to Inverness, you'll find Christians. Go to Edinburgh. Why is this? We might tell you why. Because men and women were willing to stand up and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the disciples in the Bible were persecuted, but yet they continued to preach the gospel. Now I believe there's speak to the Lord for the known 30 years old Lord has been preaching the gospel. And in that time, he's been persecuted in too many different situations. But you know today, <coughs> Old Lord and Fowler are still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was heading to Jerusalem, where change awaited him, and yet he still preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And that's why we have to be. We know people who shrink back, but we're people who go forward in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I say amen, mate? Yes. Think in eight months where God's gone on Perth. Remember, it's eight months where God's gone on Perth. It was an outreach, now it's a church. But us all started, it didn't start ten months ago. It started back in 1989 when the men got the gospel to Scotland. And the brothers and sisters were willing to stand up and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, as I said, we read the book of Acts, we mainly talk about Paul, right? But if you think about the beginning, there was Peter, there was John, Stephen, Philip, Barnabas, Timothy. There's many, many other men. It wasn't just all about Paul. And I want to tell you something tonight, brothers and sisters, it's all about one man tonight. Every single one of us is a part of the tonight. And we've all got a part to play tonight. Because tonight, there is no employment in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know something, this is no man's work. Because if this is man's work, it would never last. 30 years in Scotland, the gospel would be preached. If this was man's work, well, you wouldn't say something, it wouldn't be continued. But this is no man's work, this is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Amen. Amen. That's why it's continuing. There's a man in the Bible, right? A man called Gamal. The man was a, a teacher of the Pharisees. The man who actually taught Paul when he was a Pharisee before he was saved. And you know, when the disciples started preaching the gospel, the enemy came against them. You know what this man said? Leave him alone. Because if it's not of God, it will fizzle out. I wonder how many people said that light and life will fizzle out. But you know what the man said? If it's God, we cannot stop it. And tonight, I believe, 100%, we're living in the night is of God, and man can stop it. See, when man does, is temporary. <coughs> but what God does is eternal, it's forever. And this is God's work tonight, and man will stop it. Jesus says, I will my church, and the gates of Hades will prevail against it. Man can stop or hinder the work of God. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. No, when Paul left that city, and he came out to the city, it says, the believers have come to him, women and children, all together. And when he came out to the city, you know, you went to the city and right? you had family or friends and you visited them. Well, it was custom or tradition that they would follow you into the city, walk you into the city. But you know, something different happened here with the believers. Because they come out of the city, it says to be sure, they all got down on their knees and they started to pray. The women, the children, Paul, every single one of them, got on their knees and started praying. If Paul would have prayed for the believers, they would have prayed for Paul, they would lift up many different situations. You know what that was, brothers and sisters? Just like we did a minute ago, it was called for prayer. But they all came together in one body and brought the request for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why corporate prayer is so important for everything on us. We can pray on our own because God hears a single prayer. When we come together as a body, I hope you guys have power. There's power in prayer when we come together in corporate prayer. Can we say amen? When we come in corporate prayer, we stand in the gap in every single situation. And God hears the prayers of righteousness. Jesus. Amen. Let's read uh, 8, verse 8, 8 to 14. One of the brothers read that, right? 8 to 14. Yeah. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who, do, who prophesied, and as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we had heard these things, both we and those from the place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If the leaders place Tyre, they go to Caesarea. Then they went to a, a disciple's house, evangelist, a man called Philip. Now this man Philip was mentioned back in Acts 6. Anybody remember who he was? Anybody?
He was one of the seven, one of the deacons, remember? He was a deacon. Philip was one of the deacons chosen at the time. In Acts 8, when persecution came in and the disciples scattered, Philip was the one who went to Samaria and they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Souls were saved, there were miracles done, people were healed in the love of the unity itself. Acts 8. Then it says, Philip was led by the Holy Spirit to the desert road where he met the eunuch. <laughs> Remember the Ethiopian in the chariot? The Ethiopian was reading Isaiah 53. And Philip asked him a question. He said, you know what you're reading? How can I know, he said, unless someone explains to me? Philip got in the chariot beside him and he explained Isaiah 53. And when it came to some water, the Ethiopian asked, can I be baptized? And Philip said, do you believe? You know what he said? He said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. This man heard the gospel. I said, they believe Jesus is the Son of God. And he got baptized. And straight after that verse, it says, Philip went to Caesarea. He was in Acts 8 to 21. That's roughly 20 years. But 20 years later, we find Philip, where is he? He's still in Caesarea, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not known as a deacon, but now we call him an evangelist. Evangelist, someone who preaches the truth. Someone who continued to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what was done in that place for the 20 years that Philip was there continuing preaching the gospel of Jesus? You know, we don't hear much about that from Acts 8 up to 21, but yet in the background he's there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, some things are not seen by man, but you know some tonight, brothers and sisters, God sees all things tonight. The things we don't do that some people don't even know about. The Holy Ghost tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ knows the night. Now, we're going to the convention, right? And the main seminars now for the last 20 years. And every time you go down there, you always see the same faces of the people. You see the brothers and sisters year in, year in at the convention, at the main seminar. And you don't see them all year till you get to the seminar. The people from England I'm talking about, the brothers and sisters. But you know something, and you know they're going through problems in different situations, they're facing trials, but 20 years, they're still seeing the same people, they're still going on for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way we should be. So some people, when they face a trial or a situation, you know what the first thing they do? They run to the world for the answer. The one day tonight, the answer can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Amen. It doesn't make a difference what we're going through tonight. As I said, don't go back, there's nothing back in the world for me tonight. It's forward to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to see the work of God go, we think what God can do in another 20 years, another 25 years in Scotland. But we've got men and women who are willing to stand up and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, when the enemy comes in, we we'll face persecution, and we go back to the world, but we we'll go forward in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this man, Agabus, the prophet, came, comes in and says, and he binds his hands with a belt, and he says, the man who owns this belt, when he gets to Jerusalem, the Jews will be bound him. And it was Paul's belt. And you know, the disciples, Luke, the author of his book, he says, We tried to convince him, plead it with him not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul said, I'm willing to be persecuted, I'm willing to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. Who could say that here tonight? What well, one of us could say tonight that we are willing to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, don't believe God would want us to die physically. We know tonight, I believe he wants us to die for the flesh to become a living sacrifice for him. The things that are dying, the things that come back and going on in the Lord, and I believe the Lord Jesus Christ tonight would put us in it and to live a sacrifice life. Paul was not to go, even though the face changed, even though these men said not to go. This man Agabus said, was led by the Spirit, told him not to go. Was Paul being disobedient by going to Jerusalem? <coughs> and he didn't pay attention to what the men said. What do you think? Was he being disobedient? Can somebody read Acts 20, verse 22 for me, please? And we'll get the answer. Acts 20, verse 22. Somebody's got that in the nice and loud. See, Paul said, I go to Jerusalem bound by the Spirit. See, but the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, told Paul to go to Jerusalem. See, when this man Agabus 
what the prophecy from God said that Paul would be bound. It didn't say tell him not to go, but it was preparing Paul what awaited him in Jerusalem. He was preparing Paul. When Paul got to Jerusalem, Paul would know that change awaited him, but yet he was willing to go for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So tonight, brothers and sisters, we don't know what awaits me and you. Nobody knows what tomorrow brings. But we should be prepared for it. And how do we get prepared? How do we prepare ourselves for what lies ahead? By reading the word of God. By applying to the Lord. <coughs> being in the fellowship. Being in the fair meetings. See, when we're in the will of God, then we can be prepared for what lies ahead of us. See, these men said, when they couldn't convince Paul, they said, then let the will of God be done. See, it was God's will that Paul went to Jerusalem. And that's what happens in your life. I want to tell you something tonight. God knows about it already. It's God's will. The Bible says God knows we're coming in, we're going out. He knows the very thoughts even before we even think tonight. That's what God even said tonight. Can you say amen? Paul was going to go to Jerusalem. He was going to put in chains. Verses 18 to 22, somebody read that please. 18 to 22. <coughs> On the following day, Paul went and with us to James, and all the elders were present, and when he had taken them, he told and need them of them about what had done among the elders through his ministry, and when they heard that it was made to those glorified, and they said to him, We see the God of whom many merit of you in their hearts. Who has believed, and they are all jealous of the Lord. Amen. That's fine, Father. Paul reaches Jerusalem and he's greeted by the elders. And when Paul was at the elders, he started to tell them what God was doing among the Gentiles. That the Gentiles have been saved, churches have been put in place, men have been put in place. And you know what they do? This is the glorify God. They didn't glorify Paul, but they glorify God because it was God's work. See, you've got all men to preach the gospel, but you'll men that can't save anybody. It's God who saves, it's God who heals, and it's God who delivers. And they're glorifying God. Now, they also said, in Jerusalem, that there were multitudes of Jews getting saved. Thousands of Jews being saved. But the, the believers also said that they were zealous to the law. Although they were saved, they still wanted to keep the law of Moses. And James said to Paul, when you preach to the Jews, you tell them to ignore the basically you tell them to ignore the law of Moses, to ignore Moses. But you know what Paul said, right? And we go back to Acts, Acts 15, when it says men came down from Judea and told the Gentiles, in order to be saved, you must take the law of Moses. And when they went back to the believers and led by the Holy Spirit, Paul showed them that men were saved by keeping the law. But they're saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So the Gentiles didn't need to, be, didn't need to keep the laws. Paul said to them, if you keep the laws, it doesn't make any holier. It doesn't make any more sense. If you want to keep the laws, burn yourself in laws, because there was six, over 600 different laws the Jews tried to keep. If you want to burn yourself in laws, well, continue. But the laws will never save you. See, when Jesus came and went to the cross, it didn't come to abolish the law, but the law was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And there's nothing that we can add to that. But Paul was saying to them, you can't add to that. You can keep the law, but it will never save you. Good deeds will never save you. Following the religion will never save you. Only way we can be saved tonight is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. No longer under the law, but under God's grace and mercy. And through the body of Jesus. That's what Paul was saying to the, to the Jews. If you want to keep the law, well, continue. But all you're doing is burden yourself, but it will never save you. And tonight, brothers and sisters, no man will never be saved by keeping the law, by being a good person. Because the Bible says, good deeds are like proper acts. The only one man who saved me the night is the God man, that was Jesus Christ. Acts 21, 33. Someone read that, please. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seen him in the temple, served up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. Crying out, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who took all men everywhere against the people, the law in this place, and furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple 
and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesians, but have been the city whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Better than the in that desert. Now, as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains, and he asked who he was and what he had done. Amen. Remember the prophesied Mark, Agabus said he got to Jerusalem and bound the chains. He falls into the temple, he falls to accuse him, to beat him, and now he's bound and put in chains. Now the false to accuse Paul in the temple, right? And there were four accusations brought against him. They said, You teach against the law. Well, the thought, number one, they said, You preach against the Jews. You preach against the Jews. Against these men, teach against them. You know, I can't find anywhere in the Bible. Well, Paul teached against the Jews. Romans 9, and verse 3, he read it to the later, he went, and I said, Paul was willing to die for the Jews. He was willing to die for his men, fellow men, it says. Two, he teaches against the law. Paul never teaches against the law. Paul was telling them that you're bumping yourself with the laws, and you don't have to keep, because the laws will never save you. But you're carpeting burdens on yourself that you can't even keep. See, when Jesus came, Jesus never came to burden us, but Jesus came to take buttons away. Number three, he spoke against the temple. See, Paul never spoke against the temple because before Paul was, was saved, he would go to the temple to sacrifice, to worship the Lord. And all through the book of Acts, we find the disciples and Paul going to the synagogues, going to the temples, praising and worshiping the Lord, preaching the gospel in the temples. He defiled this place by bringing Gentiles in. See, Gentiles, non Jews, weren't allowed into the place of worship where the Jews were. They wouldn't allow them to go in. And they should divide this place by bringing Gentiles in. Paul brought four men into the temple, but he read it. It wasn't the Gentiles, it was Jews he brought in. Paul was accused of many things. To the world, Paul was accused Jesus, said he was a blasphemer, said he was demon possessed. All the disciples were Paul was accused. The disciples of the market for their faith. Your brothers and sisters, the world today will falsely accuse me and you. Did you hear what Christ had done? Did you hear what Bobby done? Did you hear what God had done? Did you hear what Mary said? That's the one we love in today. But you know something? Whether they're right or wrong, nothing can be happy to God. God knows everything, all the important, all the present, and He sees it there. People were falsely accused me and you. It was like Jesus was falsely accused, like the disciples were falsely accused. And the Christians today, nothing has changed. You will still be falsely accused. Now, Paul's been beat because of this. He's been bound and he's been put in chains. And you know from Acts 21 now, I think there's, there's dark to eight, there's seven chapters left. Paul's bound now in his head for Rome, all through these chapters. We know even being bound and heading for Rome and facing death, you know what Paul done? He still continued to encourage his brothers and sisters, because most of his letters were written from prison. He still continued to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the last verses, Paul said, I speak, and he stood on the steps and he started to speak to these men. And you know, Paul never tried to defend himself, never tried to make a case for himself. But I want to tell you what Paul done is give his testimony and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He told the people who he was. It was a Hebrew, it was a Jew, it was a Roman, I had power, I had authority, I had wealth. He read Philippians 3, you'll find the same, the same things that Paul said. He was a Gentile of Gentiles, he was a Jew of Jews, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, he had power, authority, wealth, he had everything. But as I compared to the Lord Jesus Christ, I count it as rubbish. Right. And tonight, it doesn't make a difference who we were in the world. We might have been the worst of people, we might have been the best of people. 
we might have been poor, we might have been wealthy, we might have had power and authority. That doesn't make a difference today. It makes a difference now who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what makes a difference tonight. Not by our own good deeds, not by what we've done, but what the Lord Jesus Christ done on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. Now we want to see the work of Scotland continue to grow. Then we have to be men and women, just like the disciples in Acts 8, and in the Bible Acts, we have to build but stand up and continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you're going to face persecution. The Bible says not if, but when you face various trials. And there are trials coming from each and every single one of us. We know tonight we are someone who sticks close to another brother tonight. We will never forsake us or never, never leave us from our deepest trials. And tonight that is Jesus Christ. He's here with us always. Let us pray tonight. Thank you, Lord, Father God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, Father God. Thank you, Lord, Father God. Thank you, Lord, Jesus. Help us to find the one for Father God. Help us to love out, Lord, Father God. Let me pick up this young back, Lord Jesus, and continue to preach the gospel. Help us to stay with the light and begin to be your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, this night. Praise you. Very good meeting tonight. Of course, let's make the phone working. Good meeting tonight. Yeah, very good. A few announcements.